started. Um, welcome to first geriatric grand rounds of 2021, everyone. Um, a few announcements before we get to our speakers today. Next grand rounds will be January 21st. Um, our speaker will be Dr. Tasmia Ahmed, one of our geriatric fellows. She'll be talking about sleep changes in the elderly, so please join us for that. Our next journal club will be January 14th, um, and that will be led by also Dr. Ahmed, as well as Dr. Scott, Scott Pearson, one of our clinical pharmacists. Um, other announcements, there is a division meeting after um, Grand Rounds today, um, so please uh, join that. There should be an email with a link to, um, to that meeting. Following today's Grand Rounds, you will receive an email with a link to recording of the presentation as well as a copy of the slides, um, as well as an online evaluation. So if you could please take a moment to fill that out, that would be very helpful for us. Um, we have two speakers today. Um, please go ahead and submit any questions in the chat or the Q&A box anytime during the presentation and we will answer questions for both speakers um, at the end of the presentations. So our first speaker today is Dr. Matt Babcock. Uh, Dr. Babcock got his bachelor's degree in health and exercise science um, with a concentration in pre-physical therapy from Messiah College in his hometown of Grantham, PA went on to earn his master's degree in exercise science from Syracuse University and a PhD in applied physiology at the University of Delaware. Dr. Babcock is pursuing research on cardiovascular function with his postdoc in geriatric medicine. He works with Dr. Carrie Moreau studying how aging and sex hormones influence cardiovascular function. And he will be our first speaker today, so I'm gonna turn it over to Matt. Thanks for the introduction, Dr. Hildreth. Um, this morning, I'll be discussing some of our ongoing research regarding the cardiovascular outcomes of low testosterone in older men. Uh, there we go. Um, so I'm just going to use my learning objectives as a bit of a, an outline for this morning. So I'll start um, by briefly discussing the relation between low testosterone and cardiovascular diseases, and then I'll transition into more of our ongoing research uh, talking specifically about how low testosterone affects vascular function and how low testosterone affects blood pressure regulation. Um, so decreasing testosterone is a normal function of aging in men, um, and testosterone typically decreases by about 1% per year, starting around the age of 40. And data from the Baltimore Longitudinal Study of Aging indicates that about 20% of men over 60, 30% of men over 70, and 50% of men over 80 have total testosterone below their cutoff for low testosterone, which is 325 nanograms per deciliter. Uh, testosterone has, low testosterone has been associated with cardiovascular disease, so these data suggest that uh, low testosterone may be associated with cardiovascular mortality. So you can see here they divided men into four quartiles, uh, based on testosterone concentrations. And you can see that uh, group one, shown in the lightest gray line, which had the lowest testosterone, had uh, the worst cumulative survival due to cardiovascular mortality of any quartile and significantly lower than those in the highest quartile group four. Uh, furthermore, low testosterone has been associated with coronary artery disease. Uh, this is a forest plot from a meta-analysis of 14 studies that suggests that uh, lower levels of testosterone favors the development of coronary artery disease. And finally, um, testosterone, low testosterone has been associated with the development of hypertension. So this is a spine, uh, cubic spline regression analysis that suggests that lower levels of total testosterone are associated with higher levels of systolic blood pressure. And so these and a number of other studies seems to suggest that low testosterone uh, may favor the development of cardiovascular diseases. Uh, moving on to talk more specifically about our research regarding the effects of low testosterone on vascular function. Um, I first wanna start by sort of defining what we mean when we talk about vascular function. One specific measure that I'm gonna talk about is flow-mediated uh, flow dilation, or FMD. And this is a measure of endothelial dependent dilation. Um, it's performed non invasively using ultrasound. So we make ultrasonic measures of the brachial artery in the upper arm. We measure both diameter and blood flow for one minute. Then we inflate a cuff around the upper part of the forearm. And this creates 
uh, the inflate that cuff the supersystolic blood pressure to create um, ischemia in the distal forearm and hand, which we maintain for five minutes. At the end of five minutes, we release the cuff and you get a dramatic increase in blood flow to the brachial artery. This generates shear stress on the, vas on the arterial wall and triggers the release of nitric oxide and other vasodilators. And a healthy artery should dilate in response to this, which we measure uh, using ultrasound and express as a percentage of this baseline. And this is just sort of zooming in on a single endothelial cell and smooth muscle cell. Um, so in this um, diagram, the lumen of the vessel would be sort of above these cells. And when you get increased blood flow, it triggers the release of calcium and generation of nitric oxide via um, endothelial nitric oxide synthase. Nitric oxide then diffuses into the smooth muscle where it triggers relaxation. I just wanted to highlight this because um, uh, for two reasons. One, um, in our study and, and other studies, you can bypass the endothelial cells and use a direct donor of nitric oxide to the smooth muscles um, using sublingual nitroglycerin. And this allows us to sort of separate out any dysfunction of the endothelial cells themselves versus the smooth muscles, uh, smooth muscle cells. And the other thing I want to highlight here is um, that most reductions in FMD are attributed to endothelial dysfunction and primarily dysfunction, uh, either reduced bioavailability or reduced activity of endothelial nitric oxide synthase, which in many cases is due to increases in oxidative stress, which is a potential mechanism um, that we are investigating in our ongoing study. FMD is clinically relevant. Um, these data, along with other data, suggest that FMD is a surrogate measure of coronary artery function. So in this case, you have um, FMD on the x-axis and the percent change in coronary artery diameter during an infusion of ATP into the coronary arteries. And what you can see is a, a strong correlation between these two measures. Similarly, FMD is a uh, prognostic of future cardiovascular events. In this uh, three-year follow-up study, they divided individuals into tertiles depending on their FMD response and what you can appreciate is that the lower levels, the lower two um, tertiles of FMD had uh, many more cardiovascular events in the three years following um, the initial measurement of FMD. So these and a number of other studies have led to the generalization that a 1% decrease in FMD is associated with about a 10% increase in cardiovascular disease risk. Um, there have been some studies that suggest that low testosterone may be related to reduced FMD and vascular dysfunction. Um, so in this particular study, they divided men into quartiles based on free testosterone concentrations. What you can appreciate is that FMD is significantly reduced in those individuals with the lowest level of free testosterone, especially when compared to those um, in the highest two quartiles. Um, they also express these um, as uh, continuous variables and performed regression analysis after adjusting for age. And you can see that total testosterone, free testosterone, and DHEA were all significantly correlated with FMD in this particular study. So this brings me to um, our ongoing study regarding the cardiovascular outcomes of low testosterone. And for this study, uh, we divide participants into three groups. We have one group of younger men who are between the ages of 18 and 40 years and have testosterone greater than or equal to 400 nanograms per deciliter. We have two groups of older guys. Um, both are between the ages of 50 and 75 years. And we divide them into one group or the other based on their testosterone concentrations. Um, our quote unquote normal T has uh, testosterone greater than or equal to 400 nanograms per deciliter. And our low T guys are, um, have less than 300 nanograms per deciliter. I'll um, also mention briefly that our normal T guys go through a four-week intervention um, using a GnRH antagonist to lower testosterone, and they receive either placebo gel or testosterone gel to let us uh, further investigate the effects of testosterone. Um, we're still blind to those data, so I'll just be sharing a cross-sectional data that we've generated so far. Um, in all three groups, um, during their experimental visit, they start with a 20-minute 
bolus infusion of isotonic saline as a control condition, and that's maintained as a drip infusion during our vascular testing, which includes measures of FMD. In a subset of participants, um, we've administered sublingual nitroglycerin to try and look at the effects of uh, endothelial cells versus smooth muscle cells, like I mentioned earlier. And then after sublingual nitroglycerin, we switch out that isotonic saline infusion for an infusion of ascorbic acid or vitamin C. And this is an experimental model to ac acutely reduce oxidative stress to try to get in, uh, look at some of the mechanisms that may be contributing to any reductions in FMD that we observe. Again, that's a 20 minute bolus infusion and then drip infusion maintained throughout our vascular testing, which includes a repeat measure of FMD. And these are just sham data to show what we would expect to see, especially in older men and potentially in low testosterone, where ascorbic acid would result in a higher FMD compared to the saline condition. We would attribute that difference to the suppression of oxidative stress. So um, these are the data generated so far from our study um, just during the isotonic saline infusion. What you can appreciate here is that um, both groups of older men have significantly reduced FMD compared to younger men, um, which is expected with aging for FMD to be reduced, but that our guys with low testosterone have greater or greater reduction or uh, lesser FMD than those with normal testosterone. And uh, it's important to note that this is about a 1% difference in FMD. So this is not only statistically significant, but clinically relevant as well. Uh, moving on to the subset of guys that receive that nitroglycerin, sublingual nitroglycerin, um, you can see that it appears as though there may be a trend um, for reduced nitroglycerin-induced dilation in the older men and in the um, men with low T to have reduced uh, nitroglycerin-induced dilation. So this may suggest that our reductions in FMD could potentially have some contribution of the smooth muscle um, and not, may not just be a function of the endothelial cells, but um, we still, we, because this is only a subset, we haven't reached statistical significance yet and we'll be uh, continuing to pursue uh, these potential differences um, between the smooth muscle and endothelium. Um, when we add in our ascorbic acid data, so the filled bars are the same FMD data from the previous page uh, that we generated during the saline infusion, and the open bars represent FMD during the ascorbic acid condition. And what you can see is that in both groups of older men, Ascorbic acid um, in, improves FMD, um, but if you look at just the difference between saline and FMD, you can really appreciate that um, the differences between the normal T and low T guys is not significantly different, and so it may not be oxidative stress that's contributing to these differences in FMD, although there's still work uh, to be done in this area. Um, so I'm going to move on to the effects of low testosterone on blood pressure regulation. And in particular, I'm going to be talking about the arterial ferret reflexes, as this is um, my particular area of research interest. Um, and so for those who aren't familiar or may just need a refresher, um, the arterial ferret reflexes are mechanosensitive afferent nerve terminals in the aortic arch and carotid arteries. And um, they include both the sympathetic and cardiovagal bare reflex. Um, the sympathetic bare reflex is represented here on sort of the outside line of this diagram. And in response to uh, distension of the vessels during in times of increased pressure, the bare reflexes act in negative feedback fashion. So they send inhibitory signals into the brainstem to reduce both muscle sympathetic nerve activity um, in the sympathetic bare reflex and heart rate in the cardiovagal bare reflex, which is sort of the, the inner square of this diagram. Uh, when blood pressure drops, they um, increase their signaling, which as inhibitory signals lead to reductions in muscle sympathetic nerve activity and heart rate. And in that way, provide sort of beat by beat reflex control of blood pressure. I'm gonna focus on the cardiovagal bare reflex um, because that's basically the only area that any research exists regarding low testosterone and is currently what um, I am studying in our um, ongoing clinical trial. Um, so there are a couple of different ways of measuring the cardiovagal bare reflex. Uh, the first is the modified Oxford technique, and this is the gold standard uh, for measuring 
fair reflex function and allows uh, for to measure the entire um, stimulus response fair reflex curve. Um, so what you can see um, on the right side of your screen is a recording of beat by beat arterial blood pressure. This can be done invasively um, using an arterial catheter or non-invasive using uh, finger photoplasmography, which is what we use in our study. Um, and the modified Oxford technique includes um, subsequent bolus infusions of sodium nitroprusside and phenylephrine. What you can appreciate is the decrease in blood pressure following SMP and increase in blood pressure following phenylephrine. And at the same time, you would be recording heart rate, and you can see the reflex increase in heart rate following SMP and decrease in heart rate following phenylephrine. You would then um, plot the changes in blood pressure and heart rate um, and perform linear regression to determine fair reflex sensitivity. In this case, they've broken it down into the sort of following blood pressure that occurs during SMP on the left side of this graph represented in uh, closed boxes and rises in blood pressure on the right side of this graph um, with open boxes during phenylephrine. A second method uh, for studying the cardiovascular barrier reflex is to use a valsalva maneuver. Uh, this is a forced exhalation against a closed glottis, usually for 15 to 20 seconds. And you can see on the other side of your screen in panel A, uh, representative tracing of blood pressure, um, and you get uh, falling blood pressure upon the initiation of the valsalva and a rise in blood pressure uh, upon cessation. And you can see in the heart rate recording, the reflex increase and fall in blood pressure that accompany those changes. And then again, they've broken these down into falling blood pressure and rising blood pressure um, in panel B. And you can see they've applied linear regression to determine fair reflex sensitivity uh, during each phase of the Valsalva maneuver. Uh, the final method is called the sequence method, and this allows us to measure sort of spontaneous changes in blood pressure and heart rate. Um, and this is the technique that we've used so far um, in CardiVolt. And you can see here an example. So um, this would be done during a 10-minute baseline recording, just a supine rest. Um, and you would be looking for sequences where systolic blood pressure and RR interval are changing in the same direction. This is an example of rising blood pressure and an increasing RR interval. Um, and then you would take, you would perform linear regression on each one of these sequences, uh, which you can see in the bottom panel. And then you take the average slope of all of those linear regressions to determine bare reflex sensitivity. This is an example recording uh, from one of our studies. You can see heart rhythm recorded via EKG in the red channel on the top has been converted into heart rate for each cardiac cycle in blue in the second channel. We have a beat to beat blood pressure recording in the green channel and then just measuring um, systolic blood pressure during each cardiac cycle in the bottom pink channel. And this is sort of an extreme example, certainly the most extreme example that we've seen so far, but you can really appreciate the fluctuation, spontaneous fluctuations in blood pressure and reflex changes in heart rate that occur during supine rest. I just wanted to put in one quick example of bare reflex failure that was recently published um, in the England Journal of Medicine. Uh, this is a 28-year-old woman with bare reflex failure. Um, this is, uh, what you're seeing now is recorded during supine rest. She has hypertensive and unstable blood pressure, which you can see in the bottom reporting. And importantly, what you're seeing here is that at times when blood pressure is falling, heart rate is also falling, whereas if she had an intact bare reflex, heart rate would be increased to compensate for those decreases in blood pressure. Other than put her um, into up, head up tilt on a tilt table, and you can see that both heart rate and blood, blood pressure really bottom out. Um, and she had a pacemaker to prevent her heart rate going below um, 60 beats per minute. Per minute which is, I'm sure, the only reason that she remained conscious throughout this 10-minute uh, upright tilt. Um, there really is not much data out there regarding the effects of low testosterone on cardiovascular, cardiovascular, cardiovascular air reflex sensitivity. Um, the little data that does exist is primarily from preclinical models. Um, so this is uh, one example of the few studies out there um, using rats, now rats, and they have a group of rats 
that underwent orchiectomy and uh, um, others that went through sham operations, and then they were exposed to increasing doses of phenylephrine. What you can see in panel A is that mean arterial pressure increases with increasing doses of phenylephrine in both groups. But in panel B, you can see the decrease in heart rate is significantly attenuated in those rats that have gone through orchiectomy compared to the sham operated rats. So when they plot these changes in mean arterial and heart rate and perform linear regression to measure bare reflex sensitivity, you can really appreciate that uh, the orchiectomy, orchiectomized rats had significantly reduced bare reflex sensitivity compared to the sham operated rats. Um, these data are actually from a companion paper from the same group in the same journal. Um, they took a separate group of orchiectomized rats and gave some of them testosterone supplementation and others placebo and put them through the same bare reflex testing. What you can see here is that the group that received testosterone supplementation had significantly greater bare reflex sensitivity than those that received the placebo. And what's important to appreciate here is that those rats receiving testosterone supplementation uh, had bare reflex sensitivity similar to the sham operated rats in the first study that I described, indicating that it, it probably really is testosterone that is um, playing a role in the reductions in bare reflex sensitivity uh, in these orchiectomized rats. Um, so since I arrived in July of 2019, um, I've added measures of spontaneous bare reflex sensitivity using uh, the sequence method in CardioVolt. We haven't had any young guys go through the study since I've been here, um, but in the 13 men that have participated, older men that have participated, uh, we have seven guys with normal testosterone and six with low testosterone. And as you can see, cardiovascular bare reflex sensitivity is significantly reduced um, in those low testosterone guys compared to the normal testosterone guys. In fact, it's only about uh, half of the bare reflex sensitivity as in normal testosterone. So, um, you know, this is something that I am continuing to pursue, trying to get funding to explore these relationships between testosterone and bare reflex sensitivity more thoroughly. I'd like to um, add the modified Oxford procedure as well as measures of sympathetic nerve activity to investigate the sympathetic bare reflex uh, in these men. So uh, with that, let's thank my advisors and collaborators and all of you for your attention. And I will turn it over to Dory. Thanks. Great, thank you so much, Matt. That was great.